Hi, we're 15. This is chapter 20, The Main Hall, Secret of Nim. There came a knock on Nicodemus' office door. It opened, and Justin and Mr. Aegis entered. Back so soon? asked Nicodemus. Soon? said Justin. It's past noon. It's lunchtime. Past noon? Mrs. Frisby stood up, remembering, what, remembering her children waiting at home. Down in the rat's home in the artificial light, it was hard to tell the passage of time, and she had been so engrossed in Nicodemus' story that she had not even glanced at the clock. Justin was wearing a satchel like Nicodemus's, and from it he took a small paper package. Here's Dragon's medicine, he said, putting it, in the t putting it on the table. He asked Mrs. Frisby, did he tell you about the toy tinker? Nicodemus said, no, I was just coming to that. But I can't he stay here now, said Mrs. Frisby. My children will be waiting for their lunch. A plan was worked out. Mrs. Frisby would go home to take care of her children. Nicodemus, Justin, Arthur, and the other rats involved would work out the details of moving her house, which would be done that night at about 11 o'clock. After the Fitzgibbons are asleep, and we're sure Dragon is too, said Nicodemus, Mrs. Frisby would return in the mid-afternoon to the rosebush. Mr. Aegis said, and I'm going to lay down. After making that trip with the cast, I'm tired. You can have your choice of rooms, said Nicodemus. Now that Jenner's friends are gone, we have seven that are empty. Thank you, said Mr. Aegis. Mrs. Frisby, when you return, I will tell you as well as I can exactly how to put uh, the powder in Dragon's dinner. As she hurried home, Mrs. Frisby considered just about how much she could tell her children about all that had happened and all that was going to happen. She decided at that stage, at least, she would not tell them about their father's connection with the rats. Also, that she would not say she had volunteered to put the sleeping powder in Dragon's bowl. That would worry them. She could tell them, perhaps, when it was safely done, when, among other things, there would be no chance for her Mar Martin to volunteer in her place. She would simply tell them that, as the owl had suggested, she had gone to the rats and asked for help. She had found them friendly and intelligent, and a group of them was coming that night to move their house to a place where it would be safe from the plow. That would be enough. She could tell them the whole story later, when she knew it all herself. And, but it was not enough. The children were skeptical at first, then intensely curious, especially Timothy, who was looking stronger and feeling more energetic, but still staying in bed, primarily because Teresa and Martin, Martin had made him. But why should the rats do that, said Timothy. We don't know them at all. Nobody does. They keep to themselves. Maybe it's because the owl sent me, said Mrs. Frisby, searching for an answer that would satisfy him. They seem to be impressed by the owl. For that matter, said Timothy, I don't even see why the owl wanted to help. He's no friend of ours either. Maybe they thought someday we could do a favor for them in return. Oh, mother, said Cynthia, how could we ever do them a favor? You forget I did do Jeremy a favor. That's what started this whole thing. That and my getting sick, said Timothy. I wish I could get up. I'm tired of bed. Not yet, said Mrs. Frisby. Glad to change the subject. You must save your strength, because tonight you will have to get up for a little while when they move the house. We must be sure that you are well wrapped up in the hope that the tonight is warm. It will be, said Martin. It turned quite hot outside. So they ate lunch. That afternoon, Mrs. Frisby told the children that she must leave to confer again with the rats about moving the house. When she thought that the danger she would face in just a few more hours, she wanted to kiss them all goodbye. But knowing that Timothy, at least, was already suspicious, she did not dare, but told them only that they should not worry if she was a little late getting home for supper. On her way back to the Rosebush, she felt quite relieved, almost cheerful. Her problem was nearly solved, and the final solution was in sight. If all went well, Timothy would be saved. If all went well. Then the thought of what she had to do came back to her like the clanging of an alarm bell. What worried her most was not so much putting the powder in Dragon's bowl, but the fear that the last minute she would lose her nerve and bungle it somehow. Bungle it somehow, it's an interesting word. That could wreck the plan. She looked forward toward the Fitzgibbons farmhouse, and there on the back porch, lying in the sun, was Dragon. He was watching a pair of sparrows playing in the grass halfway to the chicken yard. The tip of his tail barely twitched as he debated whether or not they were near enough to spring her spring for. He looked very big and very dangerous. At least she was not looking in her direction. At least he was not looking in her direction. And Mrs. Frisbee hurried off, hurried onto the bush directly to the hidden entrance and slipped inside. When she reached the arch portal, Brutus was standing guard as before, but this time he greeted her politely. I've been expecting you, he said. May I go in? If you'll just wait a minute, I'll get Justin. He went inside the arch and pressed a small button on the wall. Mrs. Frisbee had not noticed it before. A doorbell, she said. It rings a buzzer down below. If I pushed it three times, you'd see some action. Action? That's the alarm signal. A dozen rats would come out this door ready to fight. All the rest with the women and children would be hurrying out the back door. 
I didn't know there was a back door. It comes out into the woods in a blackberry bramble. It gets a longer tunnel than this one. When Justin appeared, they went down the same hallway as before. But this time, when they reached the chamber where the elevator was and the stairway led down, Justin paused. Nicodemus thought you might like to see our main hall. Just a quick look. He asked you, he said you asked about the plan. I did, said Mrs. Frisbee, but he didn't tell me about it. It's just, it's more than just a plan now, but we're used to calling it that. If you see the main hall, you'll get an idea of what we're doing. So instead of going down as they had before, Justin led the way across the chamber where, as Mrs. Frisbee had noticed, the tunnel continued. They walked along for what seemed like several more minutes. Somewhere right along here, Justin remarked, we're entering the woods. You'll notice the tunnel runs a bit crooked. We had to bend it to go around tap roots, some as thick as fence posts. They went on until they came to a fork in the tunnel. Right here leads out to the blackberry bramble, said Justin. Left fork leads to the main tunnel, main hall. They took the left fork. Now brace yourself for a surprise. From ahead came noises, the sound of many rats talking, a sound of hurrying and thumping and of machinery running. They stepped into a room as full of activity as a factory. It was the biggest room that Mrs. Frisbee had ever seen, half the size of her house, with a ceiling and a floor of gray, hard gray rock. It was brightly lit with electric bulbs, where the large sized ones strung unshaded, and beneath them were the rats at work everywhere. Rats running electric motors that ran belts, that ran small circular saws, la um, lathes, drills, grindstones, and other tools Mrs. Frisbee could not name. Rats hammering, welding, cutting, but most of all, rats hauling. There was a steady procession to and from the far end of the chamber, and each of these rats wore a harness to which was fastened a pair of large, sturdy sacks, one on each side, like a miniature pack horse. As the rats trooped in, their sacks were empty. They disappeared into the part of the room that was hidden by a wall of wood. When they came out, the sacks were full and heavy. As she watched, a troop of ten, their sacks bulging, went past her out the tunnel. They greeted Justin and nodded at her, but they did not pause. She noticed that just inside the entrance, an electric fan whirred quietly, aiming inward, pulling fresh air into the room where some, from somewhere out in the woods. Mrs. Frisbee stood behind Justin and gaped. She felt dizzy at the sight, the motion, the noise, and the size of the room, which must have measured 20 feet long and almost as wide. How could you dig out such a big room, she asked. We didn't. We found it. It's a natural cave. You see the ceilings and the floor are solid rock? That's the reason, or the main one, we chose to chose this spot to live. Others had lived before us, probably for centuries, before there was a farmhouse, bears, and bears, then wolves, then foxes, then groundhogs. We had quite a cleaning job to do, I can tell you that. When we found it, there was a large hurl, only a few feet long, leading straight in, but it was so full of sticks and leaves you could hardly see it. We closed out entrance entirely and dug another, longer and narrower, our back door. Then we dug our living quarters under the rose bush and the entrance you came in. But the cave is still our chief workshop. Let's go in. As they entered, some of the rats looked up. Some waved and smiled, but all quickly turned back to work that they were doing, as if they were in a hurry. They're all on schedule, Justin explained, talking close to Mrs. Frisbee's ears to be heard over the noise, so they can't stop working. One group, especially busy, was gathered around an odd-shaped object of wood and metal about a foot long. It was curved and had a point at the end. It looked, Mrs. Frisbee thought, rather like the side of a small boat. Could the rats be making a boat? Then she saw that they were fastening a strong metal ring to the top of it. Justin led her to it. That, he said, is our most important invention, the key to the whole plan. He made a pilot model last fall. We tried it out and it worked. So now we're making three more. But what is it? She asked. It's a plow. Nicodemus designed it himself. After reading every book he can find about farm tools, it's light and sharp and especially made to be pulled by rats. Takes eight of us to pull it, more if the turf is tough. But with it, we can turn over, in a day's hard work, a patch of earth about 10 by 15 feet. But why? Why would you ever need to do that? Come over here and I'll show you. He led the way to the back of the cave where the high wall stood. He opened a door and beckoned her through. She stood in a large wooden bin, starting at her feet, and rising in a slope to the wall of the, ca of the cave was a small mountain of grain. Oats, said Justin. He led her on, opening the another door of the mountain. Wheat, he said, and others. Barley, corn, corn, soybeans. We've been building these stockpiles for a long time, he said, all from Mr. Fitzgibbon's barn. We now have a two-year supply for 108 rats, plus enough food to plant for two crops in case the first one fails. In there, he gestured toward the last bit in the row, we have boxes full of seeds, seeds for tomatoes, beets, carrots, melons, and a lot more. 
All the time they stood there, the steady procession of rats continued. They entered the bins, took off their harness sacks, filled the sacks with grain, and put them on again, and left through the tunnel, out the back door. They looked, Mrs. Frisbee thought, like a very large app, a very large ants endlessly toiling on an ant hill. Justin must have gotten the same impression, for he said, If ants can do it, Nicodemus says, if the bees can do it, so can we. Do what? Why live without stealing, of course. That's the whole idea. That's the plan. All right.